point too. Uh, today we'll be in Exodus, uh, the book of Exodus, first half. Um, still in the sovereignty of God. Seems like it kind of it's going, and we'll let it go as long as we God allows it to go. Um, but before we get started, let's go ahead and take a moment of silent prayer. And for us, that just means we can uh, get in tune and confess our sins, acknowledge those to God the Father, and we are then cleansed from all unrighteousness, as the Word tells us, and then we can, uh, we'll say a prayer and then we'll get going. Let's pray. Dear Father, we are grateful to be here. We know... Each day is a, a day to experience your plan for our lives, and we're just thankful to be a part of it. We know uh, your plan keeps moving, as we've seen in our study, and we, uh, we just pray that we can continue to latch on to it in faith and be a part of it. And we trust and know that you're always faithful to us, and we ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so... We've been looking at the hardening process of Pharaoh's heart, and it's been, you know, we, we haven't gotten to the point where it's, uh, where, where God or the Lord is hardening it, but we're making our way to that. And there's a lot of chapters. You don't think about how long the hardening process goes, but uh, I think we're getting up to chapter five or six, and it's still going. And uh, one of the things that we observed last time was the huge importance of humility. Um, we saw Moses had to have humility to be a part of God's service. When you think about the, the magnitude of what was placed or, or asked of Moses, right? Uh, that takes an extreme amount of humility. And it's no different for us as believers in Jesus Christ. If we want God to use us in uh, meaningful ways, in ways that have an impact, uh, we've got to have humility. We have to have that humility because what, in whatever we do, God wants to not only use us, but he wants to use us in a way that glorifies him. And so, you know, easier said than done. We've got to have our spiritual life in check all the time. We've got to be consistent. We have to be thinking uh, the mind of Christ as we walk on this earth. And so uh, when I, I see Moses' commission from the bush, God asking him to do this great thing of free the nation, basically, of Israel. Um, you know, you got to think faith and humility, the amount of great faith that he had, even though he doubted himself. Remember, he doubted, he says, I can't do this. I, I can't speak well. I, you know, I, I have all these issues. He was trying to convince God that he wasn't the right man, but God knew he was. He knew it was a spiritual issue. It wasn't a physical thing. Moses brought that up, right? He said, I can't, you know, he was bringing up the physical. But God knew, and um, so here he is. And so, and that's the very reason God commands us to be humble uh, in his word. We looked at a few verses. Actually, there's a lot of verses that talk about humility in the scripture, right? So, um, and we looked at a couple of those, but it's all for our benefit. That's all it is. And so, and I think a good way to look at humility is it makes us capable to not only receive blessings, to receive the promotions, to receive these greater things that God wants us to have, but it also allows us to be in a position to uh, stay in them and operate and be capable within those blessings and promotions. So that's humility in a nutshell. If we can do that, leave the focus on the giver and not the gifts that he gives us, um, God wants to use you, and there's no doubt in my mind that he will because he's waiting on believers to get to a point where he can take advantage of you. So we see that in Moses. Uh, we also saw a couple things. Um, humility was directly connected to riches, honor, and wisdom. You know, one of the main things of the Christian life is wisdom, right? That's what the Word of God gives us. We need, we need wisdom, not man's wisdom. We need the wisdom of the word. Uh, we've got to have discernment. Because remember, we take the word and it goes in our souls and it displaces the false. We've got to have the truth come in, to out, in with the truth and out with the false is the idea here. So uh, we've got to have wisdom and discernment to be able to 
to be a part of, of, of these um, missions, you could say, that God wants to put us on. So he doesn't just want you to sit there and look pretty, although a lot of you do, are pretty good at that. Uh, he wants you to not just sit here. He just wants you to take what you're learning and go out the doors and actually apply it to your lives. You know, it's kind of a waste when you just come and you learn, you listen, and you leave, and it doesn't do you any good. Uh, don't, don't waste that, the spiritual food that we all have and we can actually take advantage of when we get out of here. So then we saw the first, the, uh, the word hardening, the first occurrence of it in Exodus 4, 21, it said, I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. That's the Lord speaking. He's saying, I am going to harden his heart so he will not let the people go. Remember we said that's kind of unusual that he's saying he will, so he will not let the people go. You would think it would say, so he will let the people go. Um, but I think we understand why he said that, uh, because it really became clear when we saw this, this verse right here. This is God's desire of why he's going in this direction with Pharaoh. It says, for the scriptures say, this is Romans 9, 17, to Pharaoh, says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So there's the idea. God is witnessing to the world about who he is, about how powerful his plan is, and about even in the face of opposition, it will move forward. So what he's doing is he's making Pharaoh go in the completely opposite direction of God to reject and then still show that his plan is going to continue to move forward in that direction. He's just allowing Pharaoh to do what he wants to do. That's the idea here. He, he, Pharaoh wants to reject. The Lord says, okay, I'll let you reject. But I'm also going to show you and everyone else that, you know, I am God. And I, my plan is powerful and it moves forward. And so that, that's a, an application point for us as believers. You know, when you just take this story just alone and we look at our lives and we lose faith because we're, we don't have a clue of direction. We're unsure. That's, that's life, right? Unsure. Being unsure, not sure of the details or sure of what's going to happen next. Think about this. It doesn't matter necessarily how we feel or whether we are sure or not sure. God's plan is going to continue to move forward. And I think that's a major part of our thinking process that we have to latch on to because we lose sight of that sometimes. You know, God's plan doesn't depend on us. It depends on him. So do we have a part to play in this? Yes, we do. God gave us that part to play. But another part of that is faith. We got to have the, the, the trust in God to know that, yes, his plan will move forward and that we are a part of that. So that's, I think that's huge, you know? It just shows God's grace. So what this is really, I think it's, a, it's a, a picture of a battle, a battle between God and Satan. We're watching it through people. We see God speaking directly to Moses on one end, but guess who's on the other end? Satan. Remember, we've got magicians, we've got sorcerers working for the Pharaoh. And, and Satan's working through these people. Satan's working through the unbelief of Pharaoh. He, you know, that's what Satan does. When people are blinded, he'll work through you because if you can't see the truth, what are you gonna fall for? The false. That's what Pharaoh's going for every single time as he is dealing with the situation with the Jews. His solutions are to disobey. That's what he thinks is the right answer in this situation. So don't, you know, you got to keep in the back of your mind that this is a spiritual war. This is a spiritual battle that uh, we're, we're dealing with here. And it's a conflict between God and Satan uh, that we have too. You know, this is something that goes on every day. Whether it's a small scale or big scale, it's all spiritual. Even though we, we can easily forget that because we talk, we see each other, you know, we, we associate. It's just what we see. But there's a spiritual realm that when we get kind of stagnant or off track or off our toes, that's when Satan likes to come and say, you know what, this is a spiritual battle. And because you're off your toes or not paying attention, I'm going to use you to make a bad decision. 
And so it's, it boils down to decision after decision in the Christian way of life. Are we making good decisions or are we making bad decisions? If you want to boil the spiritual life down to a nutshell, it comes down to those things, doesn't it? Decision making day to day, moment by moment. You know, how much creamer did you put in your coffee? No. Actually, how much sugar did you put in your coffee? I should have said. It's probably killing us all, right? Sure is good, though. But that's how Satan operates. Some things may seem good and, you know, appealing and the right decision. And you will choose those things if you're not on top of your game when it comes to your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so that's where we're at. And we see a lot of people choosing for God in the situation. We see a lot of people choosing against him. And we'll see what direction that goes. So, I mean, think about it. The last thing Pharaoh probably wanted to do was to demonstrate God's power in him. That's not what he wants to do. He wants to do just the opposite. That's why he's rejecting. And then you got to ask yourself, well, what does Satan want in all this? Well, he wants the opposite of God too, right? But remember what the Lord said. He said, I will harden his heart so that he will not let my people go. Now, what's Satan and Pharaoh thinking? Just reject whatever Moses has to say. Don't do it because it's from God. But see, he's, God is working him towards his end goal. That's just the power and the sovereignty of God right there. So he's really working on God's side. He just doesn't have a clue that he's doing that. So that's pretty cool. That's an awesome thing. So, um, and another thing about Satan is that, that we talked about is that he needs um, assistance, you could say, in moving his plan forward. And that assistance, what I mean by that is he needs people. He needs people on board and positive to his ideas to be able to move them forward. God doesn't need that. See, we can reject, we can deny, or we can make right decisions in the plan of God. His plan moves forward. Satan gets stopped in his tracks when we say no or yes in the right direction, right? So he needs you. He needs you on board to make those decisions uh, agree in agreement with him. And that, I think that's a big deal because Satan has zero power outside of your volition, outside of your decision maker. That's where Satan's power lies. You know, we see a lot of things happening on this earth, whether in politics or in, you know, in social uh, arenas. But at the end of the day, it's the people who decide to get themselves into these predicaments. We have the free will decision to make and whether they're blinded or not, it's still, that, that's not an excuse because guess what? Who's working their own blind, their hardness out in this, in this story? The Pharaoh. Remember, that's a process that happens over time. This isn't just God hardens his heart. This is Pharaoh working up to this point to where He's got a hardened heart. And we'll see that in some of these words today. You can see that he's actually to the point where uh, almost God doesn't have to harden his heart. He's, worked, he's, he's just worked it out himself where he's, he's hardened it himself. So that's just from that continual rejection. Um, you know, continual rejection of God. That's what happens. You start to deny truth and eventually you will shut down and shut it out completely. And that's what Satan, I think he's working towards that. But, you know, out of all this, you got you to gotta say, well, well, God still feels for him. He, he's still allowing him chances to make the right decision. You know, it's kind of amazing. You look at Pharaoh, we, we kind of see him as an enemy. We're like, man, this, this guy needs to get out of here. You know, he, he's holding the Jews. Just, just kick, give him the boot, you know, end his life, whatever we need to do. But God is continuing to give him grace, faithfulness, and chance after chance after chance. And, I, you know, as many times as I see this, some of you parents ask yourself, how many chances do you give? Well, we see a lot of chances here. Over three. I can tell you that much. One, two, three, you know the counting that I hear all the time. And it never goes to three for some reason. I'm like, well, what happened? 
So, but God is very faithful and gracious and continue because honestly, he really wants us all, whether unbeliever or believer, he wants us all in his family. He wants us all to go in the right direction, all to make right decisions. And that includes Pharaoh. And remember, Pharaoh's an unbeliever. He's rejecting completely um, God. But it doesn't matter. God still wants him to make right decisions. And when I first, you know, when you kind of grow up learning or just reading the story, you think God is just using Pharaoh almost like a rag doll, you know, like a like a chess, a game of chess. And that's kind of excluding the volitional realm of this this game, right, of life. There's always the, the decision that Pharaoh, at the end of the day, he could change the circumstances completely. Does God know what decision he makes? Yes, he does. But he still gives him a chance. And that's a big deal. You could say he already knew. So why is he even giving him a chance? You know, he, he's given him a chance. So. Um, and this tells me that, you know, we're still looking at this. Who's in control of the big picture here? And this includes your life, your circumstances in life, what happens. And so when we lose sight of this, what we end up doing and what a lot of people here are doing, at least the Egyptians and maybe the Jews, is that we get our eyes on people. We start to think that people can control our lives and we start to feel like they're in control and God is somewhere off in the distance and he forgot about us. Well, that's not what this story is telling us. Remember, this is a part of history and the God that we know is always in control. But when you get your eyes off of that, what do you look to? A president, a political party, a friend, a wife, a husband, a person. I'm not saying these things are bad things, but when you lose sight of the one that's in control, guess what? You, your faith goes into that person. And then you are in a position where Satan can manipulate because at that point we're making bad decisions because our faith is directed in the wrong. It's misdirected, right? It, it, it's directed in a person and not in God himself. So be careful. Um, because that's that's easy to do because what we see sometimes we rely on you know what we see the physical but it's not what we see it's uh it's the spiritual it's what you think where your faith comes from your soul and why that doesn't work why doesn't it work relying on people well because people are have sin natures just like you do just like i do uh, we fail uh, we falter we're not perfect and that means your faith will also waver. Wherever your faith is placed, it will waver because that person is not absolute as God is. So, so all people have sin natures. That should be pretty, pretty well known. Um, so God is just showing us in Pharaoh that no human can be in control or in power, you could say. Um, as much as they think they might be or they can be. Doesn't happen here. And then for us, I think a few words of application to get our eyes off of God, off of the Lord in this situation. Um, you know, we kind of talked about this. You'll notice that you're not as content. Uh, there's a lot of worry that may creep in, some anger. You know, I think that's when we need to start checking our faith. What, where is our faith directed? Because that's really what dictates how content you are in life. Where's your trust? And so when we get, start to get kind of off in there, off in that realm, and we start to get frustrated, that's a faith issue. I definitely believe that that is a faith, a faith issue. So. And of course, the word tells us, remember, this world will beat you up if you let it. That goes right back to the giving Satan that opportunity, giving that, him and that advantage. And of course, just the opposite is that. That is uh, John eight thirty one. So G this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. 
So he's saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And if you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. True freedom, happiness, contentment, however you want to look at it, is a soul issue that comes from what? Following. Jesus is talking about who are my true disciples? Who are my true followers, followers here? And it says it right here. If you continue in my word, that's it. In a nutshell, that, isn't that the spiritual life? It really is, isn't it? So if we want freedom, freedom from anxiety, freedom from whatever, whatever you battle, there's a lot of different things that we all have issues with, right? We all have weaknesses. We all falter and fail to certain things in our life. And freedom, we all want freedom from those things. Here it is, right here. Here's the verse that's telling us how to get that. So it's in the Word. Just be consistent about it. And then we saw in 421 that God will harden. But remember, He hadn't gotten there yet. He hadn't hardened it yet. And here we are, Exodus 7:3. It says, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. It says, when Pharaoh does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my host, my people, the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt by great judgments. Here again, notice the order. We're already in chapter seven. God's still giving, giving, um, uh, he's given chances. You see the. See what comes first? If Pharaoh does not listen and then, and God does the same thing with us. He waits for us to make whatever decision we need to make, right? We got to get to that point. God has to give you a chance or he doesn't have to, but he does because he has to let you see where your volition is going to land. He does the same thing here. And you are, we're going to keep seeing that. And that just shows me God's absolute fairness. It shows absolute fairness, and you got to include grace in this because this isn't something that happened in Pharaoh's life. This is a lifetime of rejection. Yet God is still giving him grace. Still giving him grace. And, and fairness. Uh, it's above and beyond, you know. When you think about how long God waits in unbelievers' lives, and he continually allows them to live on this earth because he wants them to make the right decision. Well, you know, that, that lasts a long time sometimes. And you wonder, we all have friends in this situation that are in a rejection mode and God is allowing them to live just for that reason. So they come to the point of faith in their life um, so they can be a part of God's plan. And you gotta wonder how long is he patient for? Well, that, that's different for everybody. Right. But we see in Pharaoh, he does. He's definitely showing him grace. So I think the bottom line is there's a limit to our bad decisions. Um, and we have to be we have to expect discipline after a certain point. Right. It's just like a mom and, a, and kids or a dad with kids. There's a certain limit that you get to. And then that's it. Right. Then you're either screaming, running, pulling, something, taking off. Something's happening at that point. Well, God, the same way. There's a limit to his faithfulness and his grace when it comes to your volition. Reject, 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 reject. He'll allow that for a while. But he still at the same time wants you to make a right decision. And the only way to teach us the right decisions is what? Well, usually through adversity. And if we still don't respond to that in our life, he'll take you, take your life. That's, you know, we do have a certain time limit on this earth. So. And, you know, notice it says if he does not listen. Isn't that the issue in our spiritual life? When we don't listen. <laughs> I'm not talking about to people. I'm talking about God's word, his directive will for our lives. When we don't carry that out, then he takes action. Then he moves in and, and disciplines us. So this is this is how we get direction isn't it. It's how we get back on track. So. Um, we we kind of start to to perk up to that when when you know, when things start to fall apart, 
usually is when we notice. Now the Hebrew word for listen here means to hear. Uh, it also means obedience. It also means obedience. And that goes hand in hand, I think. Listening, hearing, and obedience. Because you know, you can hear, but when you think about listen, you also think about a change. There's a change that happens, that occurs in your thinking. You know, we can hear, but are we obedient when it comes to God's word? Well, that means something has to take place within your soul where you are convicted enough to go out and think differently. Isn't that the transformation process that the word gives us? It changes us internally. It, it changes the way you make decisions. It changes the way you live your life. It changes the way you associate with other people. It just changes you as a person. That's what the word of God does. And so in order, this word is saying, if he does not listen, it's saying, if he does not make a change. It, it, that's what he's waiting on. God is constantly waiting on us to make the change. Remember, the holdup is never on God's end. It's always on our end. So, uh, you know, everyone wants the benefits. Everybody that, you, you know, we're human. We all want the benefits of the spiritual life. We want the contentment, we want the happiness, we want the blessings. But a lot of people get the cart before the horse. They lose the track of the fact that this, all these things that the spiritual life can give us, we've got to have that obedient aspect before we get to that part. And that's where the, I think the work comes in, right? The faithfulness on the believer's part. Um, if we want to be happy, we can't just say, oh, look at him. You know, I, I would love to have that. Do it. Get there. God's given us all the opportunity to, to, to get to a certain place. Maybe we didn't have that in our whatever career we were in, our physical career. That's not the same in the spiritual life. God allows us to go to the very top. And I think that's another neat thing about this is that the, there is no limit to how far you take your spiritual life and your relationship with Christ. There's no limit. He allows you to go as far as you want to go. Get as many PhDs in the relationship with Christ as you want. And he will honor that. And, and what comes with that is what? What we just heard. Wisdom, blessings, happiness and contentment in this life. Can't just say you want it and not do anything about it. Um, one of the things I've heard before is, you know, I've heard that God was unfair with Pharaoh and the Egyptians. But, you know, when we see verses like this, it's showing just the opposite. If this, then this type of thing. God is showing that, hey, I'll, I'll uh, honor your, your volition. Um, and sometimes you find that when people are trying to assign God a trait that isn't his, that is imperfect. Usually it's just a way to justify their own lifestyle, right? If God is unfair or maybe they don't believe in him, maybe they're trying to justify their own wrong decisions. But at the end of the day, um, we know that God is perfect. And we know that also we are ultimately uh, responsible. So when Moses and Aaron went to speak to Pharaoh, about releasing the Jews. It says that Moses was 80 and Aaron was 83 years old. And Pharaoh wanted them to work a miracle is what he wanted. He wanted a sign. So Aaron threw down his staff and remember it became a serpent. So, and that didn't do it for Pharaoh. It just didn't work. You see that in Exodus 713. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Here we go again. And he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. So the Lord had already said that he's not going to listen. This doesn't have to do with the, that he will harden. He said he will not listen. And then I will harden. So see, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. God hadn't stepped into the hardening process yet. This is all Pharaoh on his own right here. The verb hardened here is the same word we saw earlier, but now it's in the imperfect tense. And all that means is that this is an action that is continuous. It started in the past and it's continuing up to the present. That's the imperfect tense. 
So it tells you right there, Pharaoh's fully responsible for the hardening process up to this point. Remember, this is a continuous thing and it's not completed. Remember, perfect tense is complete. It's done deal. Imperfect means it's open. It's still open-ended. So Pharaoh's still moving in that direction. God hadn't even stepped in yet. You could say a better translation, I think, that's more understandable would be Pharaoh's heart was continuing to be hardened. That's easier to understand. It goes with the perfect tense. So this is nothing new for him. He's just rejection, more hardening. That's how that works. But there, we know there will be a completion. There, there is a, you know, a completion of the, where you can't hear or you won't listen at all. Um, but we do have a clue of Pharaoh's already locked in. Uh, you could say locked in rejection of God. And it says he did not listen to them. Now the word means to hear or perceive by the ear. But sadly, this, this verb, did not listen, is in the perfect tense. This is a, a complete thing that's not going to change. How many people do you know you give them good advice after good advice? You try to get them on board with the word. You want them to go in this direction, and they shut it down, change the subject, go the different direction. They don't want any part of it. Nothing. Well, that's part of the hardening process. That's part of the hardening process. I'm not saying they won't accept. You know, there's, there's a certain point before we get to this point, God gives us grace in. But it says this is in the perfect tense. That means that Pharaoh can't hear the truth anymore. Not that he can't hear you physically speaking to him, but that he can't hear uh, the truth. And that's, that's not a good place to be, right? He's, you could say he's lost his ability to perceive truth. So, so here we have the next sign. This is actually the first plague. This is turning the water into blood so that the people couldn't drink. That's in Exodus 7, 14 through 24. And you can see the status of Pharaoh's soul here in verse 14. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. So you can see this word for stubborn here. It means to be heavy, weighty, burdensome, dull, or unresponsive. That's a good, I think that's a good explanation of what happens to people, right? The more we reject, the more unresponsive we become. We become kind of dull, kind of numbed up to the fact that someone is trying to offer you advice or is trying to give you uh, you know, set you up in the right direction. You become unresponsive. That's a good word for it. Because when you respond, guess what you do? That's that change. That's that desire to move in the right direction. Pharaoh has absolutely no desire to accept good advice. And it happens, you know. But that doesn't mean we give up on these people. Just because they continually reject, reject, reject. Your influence has more of an impact than you know. I'm not saying you may need to stop talking about spiritual things. You may need to do that. Some of us like to just shove that stuff down people's throat. Well, you know, there's a point where you have to say, okay, that, that's enough of maybe talking about a certain thing, maybe even about God. And it's more about your presence. Or more about having a general conversation and having an influence indirectly because of your character. There's a change that has to happen when you're dealing with people that are stubborn and refuse to listen. You got to go at things at a different angle. And it's not always necessarily directly talking about scripture. There's nothing wrong with that because remember you have the mind of Christ and therefore whatever you talk about, you should always be carrying this attitude with you. You can still glorify God without quoting a scripture directly. Remember, you're talking to people that have no truth, that are in a place in their life where they need positive. They need um, anything that they can latch on to and hold on to that you have. 
And the question is, how do we get that to them where they will at least be drawn in that direction? Because that's what we're here for. One of the reasons we're here for. Uh, I'm thinking of the, the word that God uses us to call others to him. That not ne isn't necessarily a calling physically. It's, it could be that, that presence that you have around them. Maybe you see these people every day. There is a perception of you that they have. They have a picture in their head. And if we are um, keeping these things in mind as we go throughout our day, you know what? You have the ability to set the example, to set the example. People want to follow an example. That's just in us. That's a part of who we are. You know, a good leader is someone you want to follow, right? You ever had a good boss? You're like, man, you know, it's great being under under this guy. He's, he's a, there you go. Spiritual life, same exact thing. People see you. They see something that they want and they want that. Where do you get that? Where do you find it? See how it all eventually goes to this where the spiritual life is our source, which is the word. That's really where we're, we're going to here. We're going to, to draw them. That's that call, indirect call. So don't, don't lose patience. Don't lose, uh, just shut them off because it's easy to get in that, you know, when we get rejected, when someone, tell, you know, someone gets irritated, we kind of just, okay, whatever, wipe my hands up and just, you know. But take a different approach. Try that. Try a different approach. And then we have the word, you see the next word, refuses. He refuses. Now this word, there's an intensification on this word. And I think it's, it's meant to emphasize he's absolutely shut out. He, he is refusing. There's no question in his mind. He's not contemplating maybe. He just refuses to let the people go. There you go. There's Satan working it. And doesn't, isn't that what God wants? God is, is he, he's getting him to the point where he doesn't let the people go, right? That's what we saw at the, at the beginning. Because God wants to show his power, even though, you know, Pharaoh's trying to hold on. And he will. So refuses, absolutely refusing. Um, just keep in mind, the Lord hadn't hard, hardened Pharaoh's heart yet. But look where he's at. It's completely rejecting. We already saw that Pharaoh is a burden to himself and he's unresponsive. And I think a big part of the spiritual life is response. We respond to God on a daily basis. Um, but when someone rejects God long enough, you become unresponsive. And that's where that's where Pharaoh is. And then we have verses 20 and 21. So Moses and Aaron did even as the Lord had commanded. And he lifted up the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood. The fish that were in the Nile died and the Nile became foul so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. And the blood was through all the land of Egypt. So there you go. Um, and here's their reaction. But the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. Now, I didn't mention this on the, on the last one, but these magicians and the sorcerers had been doing the same things that Moses and Aaron are doing. They're, they're, they're coming along and they're doing the same things. Remember I told you that Satan has a certain amount of supernatural power that God is allowing him to use that can have a major influence on people. There's a lot of things that Satan can do that are superhuman. And this is one of them. The magicians and the sorcerers are turning water into blood. Okay, right here. And now what is Satan doing in this situation? It's influence. When you have a friend, an associate come up to you and convince you of something that you're maybe kind of leaning in the direction of, that plays a part in our lives, right? People influence us and the way they do that is they do it because 
maybe you have a tendency to be going that direction. And many times we'll go ask people that we only want to hear the right answer from advice. Because we're already leaning in one direction. But we see that these magicians, they're just on board. They're on board with Pharaoh, right? Everybody, obviously these people are unbelievers if they're, uh, they're probably demon possessed if they're doing these kinds of um, tricks, you know, magic, black magic, whatever you want to call it. Does it have the same thing though? You see Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And, and the goal of Satan through these magicians is to keep people blinded, keep them blinded. That's the whole objective of Satan. You've got light and you have darkness. If I can keep you in the darkness, mission accomplished, according to Satan. And there's a lot of ways to do that through people, through events, through things to take away your time from the word, get you away from a relationship with God. So subtle, too. Notice that throughout your day, something distracting your mind, getting you away from your relationship. You know, it gets down to those details. Sometimes, And we have to pay attention to these things because Satan will distract through people, through people, people that are well intended, but have no spiritual life and they have no concern about your spiritual life either. They're not concerned about whether you make a decision in the right direction towards God, not in the least bit. They don't think about these things, but it will cause heartache in your life. See how important it is. Most people. You're the minority. Most people in the United States aren't concerned about a spiritual soul glorifying God in their daily lives. OK, so when you get advice, take that into account. What kind of advice are you getting? Because many people aren't as in tune as you are. They aren't concerned about faith in their relationship in Christ. So usually the advice comes by way of a physical, what people can do and what people can offer. Guess what? You can't fix spiritual solutions with physical things that man offers. I mean, we, we've talked about that before. So, so we see, I don't know if Pharaoh really needs much influencing here, but he, he's, he's being influenced. So we're almost to a break. Stay with me a couple more minutes. See everybody's starting to kind of move around a little bit. So this is this word hardening here. It's a little bit different word. It means to grow firm or to strengthen. Now that's obviously in the wrong direction. When you think of strong and strength, you think, well, hardening this way is a negative sense, right? But the Lord is still not involved in the hardening process. So, and then we have, he did not listen. This is the, another inability to hear. Um, but here the intensification is gone as it was on the last one. So that tells me that it's just a part of who he is now. God was pointing out that he got to a point, that word was intensified. Now it's just no big deal. It's just how he's operating. He can't hear. It's, it's just, you know, natural to him. And then I'll read uh, verse 23. It says, Then the Pharaoh turned and went into his house with no concern even for this. No big deal. It wasn't a big deal, right? And this is an interesting word because it has the word heart in it. But for some reason, the, the NASB didn't bring that out in the translation. I understand what they're saying, no concern. But the word heart is literally in the text. And we'll bring it out. I mean, I'm not saying this is a bad translation, but um, anyways, let's go ahead and uh, take a break and we'll say a prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the ability to receive it, to understand it, and also to uh, just apply it because you are a gracious God. And we know that you're in full control and we uh, know that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, just for us to uh, have the ability to have access into this whole plan and salvation of eternal life. Your word tells us we are saved by grace through faith 
And that is not of ourselves. It's a gift of God so that no one can boast. And we thank you for the ability to be able to accept Jesus Christ through faith alone in Christ alone. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.